Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Counterfactual Gaming, the gaming channel where if there's something historical, we don't do it. Now today I've just capitulated Germany using heavy tanks and paratroopers because I actually want to look at aircraft. I want to talk about the meta related to fighters now that Arms Against Tyranny is released. Now I had originally planned for this video to talk about Mios and to talk about all different kinds of stuff. But as I discovered as I was running my tests, uh, it, w the issue of what is a meta aircraft is actually more complicated than I originally thought. Because as it turns out, Mios have a significant influence on aircraft design, but also Mios are not anywhere remotely identical to each other. And on top of that, the changes to range in Arms Against Tyranny are uh, a big factor in how we should look at aircraft. So today we are going to talk about what can be considered a meta fighter. You can't see it, I'm doing big huge scare quotes. But we're going to talk about it in kind of a weird way. When I say that we're going to be talking about it in a weird way, I want to differentiate between top modules and bottom modules because my plan for aircraft design in Arms Against Tyranny isn't just what is the best fighter you can have looking at all of these module slots, but instead we're going to deal with them in terms of offensive armament and then look at it in terms of defensive and range modules on the bottom because there are a lot of different situations your aircraft have to be in and depending on where you're deploying them, depending on the circumstances in which you're, you're fighting, depending on your economy, it might change what you do on this bottom row versus what you're doing on this top row. So for the first part of this video, we're gonna talk about armament. What should a meta fighter have for armament? Then we're gonna talk about what you should have in your range and armor slots. And after all that, then we're gonna have a little chat about Mios and how Mios can change things, okay? But first, let's talk about aircraft armament. So when we're talking about armament, it, we have to discuss how the tech tree changed in Arms Against Tyranny. First of all, uh, Cannons 2 is really far down the tech tree now. It's it's not a technology most countries are going to get at a point where it matters during the war. There is also a large cannons tech, which is also pretty far down in the tree. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's a more advanced tech. But if we're going to be talking about aircraft from the period of, say, 1939 to 1945, for the most part, we're gonna be looking at aircraft that have heavy machine guns or cannons one as an option for their offensive armament. So there's no point in trying to compare, say, heavy machine guns to cannons two. Off camera, I did a quick little examination of large cannons versus heavy machine guns and large cannons versus regular cannons. And yeah, large cannons are terrible for anything other than shooting down bombers. But we're gonna be primarily concerned with whether we should arm our fighters with cannon ones or whether we should be arming them with heavy machine guns. Light machine guns, they're too wimpy and low tech to be a part of this discussion. If you intend to be at war in 39, 40, or 41, just pretend light MGs don't even exist. We're looking at these two things. But when we look at those models, we have to look at the difference and understand the difference between what heavy machine guns bring to the table and what cannons bring to the table. Because when we look at my tests, the results aren't gonna make any sense if you don't understand the difference between cannons ones and machine guns. Cannons one, 20 air attack, penalty to agility, they weigh six and they cost five. Heavy machine guns, 12 attack, weigh four, cost three. Now, this is important. Clearly, Cannons 1 brings a ton of air attack to the table compared to heavy machine guns. Uh, it does penalize agility. They also weigh more, which means the more cannons you put on the plane, the less you can do with modules down here. But they also cost more to implement. This is going to be a significant factor in our discussion because Planes that just use heavy machine guns, I can make more of those planes than I can planes with cannons. 
And this agility penalty hurts cannon-bearing planes in combat in ways that heavy machine guns do not hurt them. Also, obviously cannons do better on log strike than heavy machine guns, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're not worried about that. We're just looking at fighters. Uh, if people want to know more about it, I will have a whole discussion of how to build a good multi-role aircraft later on. That's not what we're doing right now. So, in the big scheme of things, the more cannons we put on an aircraft, the more expensive it becomes, the less agile it becomes, but the more air attack it has. The more heavy machine guns we put on the plane, the cheaper it becomes, and the weaker its air attack is, but I'll have more weight available to do stuff down here. What this means is that when I test fighters against each other, we have to do what we call IC normalized tests, which means we have one group of planes, say 6,000 of them flying, but their opposing planes, if they cost more, you have to use fewer of them uh, scale to the ratio and the cost of the aircraft so that we are factoring in the cost of the planes. We're not trying to test which plane is better in a one versus one duel. We're not dueling aircraft here. I don't care about dueling aircraft. We're talking about thousands of planes versus thousands of planes. And when we're thinking on that kind of economies of scale, cost matters. All right, so how do we test these aircraft? What are the conditions under which I test them? Well, I'm doing my normal English Channel test France versus Britain. Uh, I'm giving 6,000 aircraft versus 6,000 aircraft IC normalized tests. We're doing planes that start the test with full XP, but as you can see here, this is the result of one of my tests. Uh, air XP is going down on the wings as they take losses over the English Channel. We are running all of tests with centralized control and air crew surveys. The centralized control here for the air mission efficiency is really important. And we're running full uh, strategic destruction tree for both sides, mainly for this 10% to agility here, but also because, again, like doctrines really matter in terms of aircraft performance, and having this spirit here on the Air Force makes a big difference in aircraft testing results. I did a round of testing where I didn't actually make both sides equal and I couldn't understand why one side was losing five times as much aircraft as the other side. Well, it's because only one side had full doctrines and had centralized control on the other side I forgot to apply them and they were just getting slaughtered. So equal doctrines, equal spirits on it. When we put the planes against each other, we're only testing whether the which plane is better. We're also I don't have any ministers appointed to either side. And when we're testing all of these aircraft that we're gonna see in the test, you're gonna notice I don't have MEOs applied. I'm gonna talk about MEOs at the end of the video, but when I did these tests initially with MEOs, I got very weird results because it turns out there are a lot of different effects different MEOs have. And because countries have different MEOs with different effects, I was getting all kinds of weird results. Again, I will talk about those later. Okay, so first test I did. Pure heavy machine guns versus pure cannon ones. Now, because the cannons weigh so much, you'll notice that I can only put drop tanks on here to give these planes a range of 812 kilometers. But if we go back and look at the French planes with the heavy machine guns, you'll notice that the heavy machine guns weigh a lot less. So I can do things like add armor and I can add extra range so that the French planes cover the channel perfectly no matter where they're based. Whereas the British planes have some mission efficiency penalties because they just don't have as much range. Uh, this was just to establish a baseline just to see how much of an impact air attack and weight was having on the planes. And uh, I'd ran the test for a month with IC normalized tests. 6,000 French planes versus 5,400 British planes because the cannons are much more expensive. So this is an IC equal test. And the result was that the French lost uh, 2,215 of their heavy machine gun planes versus 2,437 cannon fighters. The cannon fighters really underperformed against the HMGs. 
I expected this result, but what I found most interesting is uh, why this was happening. One, because of airfield arrangement, uh, some of these planes You'll notice that they have they lack range to completely cover the area. We'll talk about range more in the, later on in the video, but the lack of range has an impact on some of these planes. But the big thing that really hurt the cannon planes they either have range to cover the channel adequately, or they can slap on armor plates, but they can't do both. If we slap on armor plates, the range goes down to 585, and it's really short range. If we slap on self-sealing fuel tanks, the range is 650, it's still kind of low. It does pump that air defense up, but with that low air defense from having the drop tanks to give them the range they need to cover the air zone, that low air defense is penalizing them when we're talking about their performance against the HMG fighters because they cannot fill out the bottom row. They just can't do it. Now, for all the other tests I do for guns versus guns, the planes are going to have the same modules on the bottom row. But because the cannons weigh so much, I can't fill out the bottom row. And this extra air attack provided by these cannons does not mitigate the loss of air defense. So, what we learn already is that the air defense stat is actually really important. It's been really important. I've emphasized it in other videos, but here again, the air defense stat is super important. And what you should not be doing in Hearts of Iron is trying to make glass cannon fighters that maximize air attack and minimize air defense. That's a terrible strategy. These much more expensive planes lose to the cheaper planes that have decent air attack. Pure heavy machine guns beat pure cannons. Fair enough. But what if we instead do a pure heavy machine gun build that looks something like this, and we fight that against a Spitfire, but this Spitfire just has one set of cannons and has some heavy machine guns instead. This gives it enough weight to include some defensive modules and some range modules. So now we're comparing two planes that have the same bottom row modules, but we can just look at armament. This gives us very different results. What we see here is 5,700 Spitfires, those are cannon fighters, versus 6,000 French planes. And if we look at this, the British lost 2317 of their cannon fighters versus 2475 French planes. Now, these results are much closer together. And you're going to say, okay, the British obviously won because they lost fewer aircraft. But we want to tally the IC cost of the aircraft that were shot down. Because it's not just about the number of aircraft lost. We also want to keep in mind that the planes cost something. The French plane costs 35, and we lost 2475 of them. So 2475 times a cost of 35 means the French lost 86,625. If we look at British losses, we see that the British lost 2,307 aircraft in air combat, which totals to 85,359 IC cost. A clear win in terms of IC cost for the cannon British fighters. The difference though between the French and the British planes are really small. It's a 1,266 IC cost difference between the two. Which is about 1.48% more production costs lost by the French than by the British, which gives a clear win to cannon fighters with one set of cannons mounted. It is a clear win for the Spitfire. But the improvement is so marginal that when we talk about Mio's later in the video, there it's you're going to see that there are times where it's not going to make sense to put any cannons on an aircraft, and there are going to be times where you really want to put those cannons on an aircraft. A 1.48% difference in losses is enough to change the outcome of the war, but all other things being equal, if you are designing a fighter in Arms Against Tyranny, this is probably where you should be going. Now, I did also try a two cannon setup, but 
it had similar problems to the three cannon setup. And I'm not going to waste your time showing you that. So for right now, all other things being equal, this is what you want in your top row. One set of cannons, two set of heavy machine guns. So now that we've talked about what goes in the top row, let's talk about what goes in your bottom row. Now this is where things get complicated because different theaters of the war have kind of different range requirements. Now when I was just testing over the channel, I, when possible I was using a standardized loadout for my bottom row just so I could fine tune cannons versus heavy machine guns. But when we're now looking at the bottom row and trying to figure out what to do that is meta in the bottom row, we need to consider how much range you actually need on your plane. Because when we look at range in the west, you can look at this and go, okay, this these aircraft have plenty of range. A thousand kilometer range gives them all kinds of of ability to project air power but when we start looking out like say over here ukraine is a huge air region you need more range there central russia it's a big air region you need more range there when we're talking about the mediterranean if you really want to reach from sicily all the way to north africa you need some good range if you really want to project air power from cairo to other places you need a lot of range and this doesn't even get into the Pacific. And I had originally a whole thing planned for talking about range in the Pacific, but I'm not gonna address that in this video. I will address that in a video when I talk about medium airframes, if anyone's interested in that. But if you've seen me live stream, you understand that when we're out in the Pacific, you want to base planes in Manila with like a 2,500 or more kilometer range so that they can actually project air power into Japan's airspace. What I'm going to tell you is that uh, when it comes to range, we're going to remove all these modules while I talk about this. The default range on the 1940 light airframe, 650 kilometers not that great it's that's kind of too low what i would say for most players that a range value of 800 kilometers is good enough for western europe but the asterisk to that is we need to add defensive modules because as i said earlier air defense is an important stat every armor plate we add reduces range but if we add extra fuel tanks we lose air defense. Also, if you care about fighters, do not use this module with fighters. Uh, the air defense penalty is so huge that the cost reduction and the aluminum reduction, it doesn't matter. You're just going to lose tons of planes. So just pretend this module is not even here when we're discussing fighters. And we're obviously not going to be using dive brakes on fighters because it's only useful on multi-rolls or our close air support or like navs or something. So when we're talking about air defense, armor plates give you your air defense, giving more range besides drop tanks, removes air defense, and then you've got self-sealing fuel tanks, which adds a whole bunch of air defense without the range penalty, but costs more rubber. What I would say is optimize your plane for around 800 kilometers, and that's going to be good enough. But the question then becomes, do I need to use self-sealing fuel tanks? Because self-sealing fuel tanks are the obvious answer to boosting air defense a whole bunch. Look at that. That's a, that's a big chunk of boost to air defense without penalizing range. Well, the answer to that is complicated. So I want to show you some data of aircraft without self-sealing fuel tanks fighting aircraft with self-sealing fuel tanks but then we're going to talk about whether the extra rubber is really worth it what i did for this test to look at self-sealing fuel tanks is i made identical planes for britain and france top row armament using cannons and heavy machine guns and what i did is i gave the french a range upgrade drop tank upgrade and gave them a self-sealing fuel tank and then I gave the British armor plates instead of self-sealing fuel tanks. Everything else is the same. Neither plane has Mios. 
both planes do have enough range to cover the air region they are fighting in. So the range difference doesn't matter. So we are literally testing the difference just between one armor place module versus one self-sealing fuel tanks module. And the results of the test clearly favor the French who had the self-sealing fuel tanks because they lost only 2,077 planes versus the 2,514 planes that the British lost. That's a clear win just in terms of modules. I've got no problem saying it. That self-sealing fuel tank module definitely has a huge impact on air combat. But we're not just asking whether it has a huge impact on air combat. Is it worth the increase in the rubber cost? Because, if you're not, just in case you're not clear, the British planes cost one rubber. We go look at those French planes. Look at that. They cost two rubber now. Twice the rubber. Do these losses justify doubling the rubber cost of the aircraft? Well, the answer to that is it, it really depends. For Germany and Italy, as members of the Axis, it doesn't even make sense to do that because they have to build the synthetic plants they need to supply the rubber to build the planes. And you're not saving twice as many planes with those self-sealing fuel tanks. You are paying twice as much rubber per plane, but you are not saving twice as many planes in combat. The Soviet Union. The Soviet Union can import rubber via land from Malaysia if they really want to, barring, uh, some sh barring some conflict with Siam or conflict with Japan after Japan takes this. They can import it over land, but they still have to buy the rubber from Malaysia. Every eight units of rubber the Soviets are using, they've got to buy from somewhere because the Soviets don't have that. Now, the Soviets can also build synthetic plants, but if they're doing that to cover their rubber costs, they're in the same boat as Germany and Italy. Unless the Soviets want to boost Malaysia for some reason, it's kind of up in the air whether it's worth it to you or not to do that. Should Japan use self-sealing fuel tanks? Well, until Japan has occupied this stuff in the southern resource area, probably not. Once you have the southern resource area, if you're going to hold on to it, yeah, you've got the, all the rubber you need to do self-sealing fuel tanks. Um, you could import that rubber before the war, but you'll want to seize all of the rubber super fast before your factories shut down from not having any rubber. Because you're not going to be able to buy rubber from anywhere else. U.S. Dominions. What should the Dominions in the U.S. do? Well, if the U.S. wants rubber, the U.S. is going to have to buy from Dutch East Indies, Malaysia... Uh, Britain by herself, even though Britain controls the rubber here, uh, Britain by herself does not have enough rubber to purchase in order to supply U.S. needs if the U.S. goes to self-sealing fuel tanks. So as the U.S., you have to make the choice. You're like, well, okay, is it worth me buying 30 billion things from Malaysia or the Dutch East Indies in order to have better aircraft? And that's a question I can't answer you because that depends on how you're playing the U.S. or playing the Dominions. So when we look at self-sealing fuel tanks, this module is worth including, but only if you can afford the rubber to put on the planes. If you can't afford the rubber to put on the planes, you sh should instead be using armor plates. Now... With that being said, what does an ideal 1940 plane look like? Well, I'm going to say that an ideal 1940 plane, if I have the rubber, is going to look something like this. We're going to use drop tanks to get the range to around 800 kilometers. We're going to use self-sealing fuel tanks. We are not going to add armor plates because it's going to drop our range too low. But this is kind of what we're going to go with. But again, this is assuming that we want a range of around 800 kilometers. If we need more range, we've got to add the extra fuel tanks. If I want less range, if I want less range, I mean, I can just stack armor plates with self-sealing fuel tanks. Uh, 520 is not really a good range for projecting air power, but 
If you're fighting really short range of air conflicts, knock yourself out. Hey, stack stack those armor modules. Get that air defense up. But for most players in most situations, with self-sealing fuel tanks, this configuration should work well for you. If you are using armor plates instead of self-sealing fuel tanks, that'll take you down to here. You may want to stack some extra fuel tanks to give it range to overcome the penalties from the uh, armor plates. And just to be clear, armor plates provide more defense than the defense reduction from the extra fuel tanks. And if you're fighting in areas where you need more range, then this configuration right here or this configuration will be better for your fighters if you just need the air range coverage. Again, different theaters have different range requirements. Now we can talk about the impact of Mio's. I did some initial tests with Mio's applied and then I stopped those tests because they were having wildly different impact. But the reason they were having a wildly different impact is because different Mio's have very different starting positions and some of them have very different upgrade paths. So this is France's light aircraft designer. You can see it starts with an agility, speed, and air attack boost. And those are all good boosts for fighter aircraft. But if we tag over to Britain, and we're like, okay, what does Britain start with? Oh, okay, well, we have Supermarine. Well, what does Supermarine do? Well, Supermarine starts with a bonus to agility, but a penalty to range. And you can see the upgrade paths are completely different, including some weird stuff that's not even available to the French company, like the seaplane origins tray. What this means is that when we're talking about Mio's and we add that to the discussion, your standard meta fighter may need to be tweaked a little bit based on what Mio's you have available. Supermarine applies a 10% range penalty, so... If I go here and go to my Spitfire, if I add Supermarine, okay, that's gonna cut the range down a bit already. It's gonna make it more agile, but depending on what you're trying to accomplish, Supermarine 65 kilometer range penalty may not be what you're looking for, or maybe you don't care. What that does mean though, is that Mios can have very different outcomes when we look at all of the bonuses that they can apply. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna use the add funds cheat and we're gonna level up Supermarine all the way. And we're gonna look at all of the different options here. And then we're gonna do the same thing to the French light aircraft designer. And we're gonna see how different they get. Okay, so we're gonna make a choice here. We're gonna go ahead and pick this. We're gonna pick this, pick this, pick this. I mean, we've got, we can pick all the traits. We just have to make sure we pick the right things on the mutually exclusive ones. Pick this, this, this. Okay, mutually exclusive. Do we want production efficiency or do we want range and air attack? We'll pick up the air attack one. Do I want ground attack or air attack? We're definitely picking air attack, picking that, and picking that. Okay, so now Supermarine provides a 35% air defense bonus uh, a max speed boost of 35%, increased fuel usage, high agility, air attack, reliability, sub-detection, surface detection, and naval targeting, which doesn't apply to fighters, but if you wanted to make a nav version of this, those would be useful. Okay, so let's go take a look at the French designer. And we're gonna, we're gonna add funds to the French designer. Okay, so, We'll pick this tray, this tray, we'll pick all of these trays. Now you'll notice the French designer has a bunch of mutually exclusive traits. All right, so do we pick the agility one? Well, we're not gonna pick the ground attack ones because we're trying to design fighters. Or do we pick the air attack one here? Uh, if we go down here, what do we do? So we're gonna go the middle path just to show you how different they are. And so if we look at the bonuses here, these bonuses are not nearly as good as Supermarine's bonuses. So when we're talking about Mio's being involved, you cannot count on the same stats being applied to, from different Mio's on a country by country basis. Uh, the stat differences once you've leveled up Mio's are significant. Now, prior to Arms Against the Tyranny, 
yeah, there were some design companies that were different. These are much starker differences. What does that mean? Well, what that means is when we're designing aircraft, any cannons we put on the British planes that use Supermarine are going to be boosted far more than when we put cannons on those French planes because the air attack bonus that Supermarine gives really ramps up the effectiveness of those cannons versus the heavy machine guns just because the heavy machine guns have a lower base air attack than cannons do. All of this is a roundabout way of saying that the more air attack bonus your Mios provide fighters, the more you should invest in cannons. But if you have no air attack bonus, but you have lots of agility bonuses, you may consider removing cannons from your build entirely and just focusing on heavy machine guns because cannons hurt agility, but heavy machine guns don't. So lean into that agility boost. Now with Supermarine, since it has both the air attack and an agility bonus, obviously like it would make sense to use cannons on this build even with that agility. But just to show you how odd some of these Mios can be, I want to tag to the US. Uh, we're going to add funds just like we did before and we're going to look at US design. First thing you're going to notice is that the US doesn't even have uh, a light fighter design that's like Supermarine. They have the range focused and the Lockheed one. If we look at North American, also has a lot of bonuses for medium and light aircraft but not a lot of bonuses strictly for light aircraft but also North American has a bonus to transport aircraft so the US like I could probably do a 20 minute video on how to design aircraft just for the US because their MEOs are completely different so when I tell you that a meta fighter would have this kind of armament and would have this kind of a bottom row setup. I'm doing that outside the context of Mios. Mios are going to change the math on some of these stats and I don't want any of my viewers to sit here and think that I'm just giving you a cookie cutter template to go with. You have to use your brains and say, okay, I'm using this Mio, maybe I need to change some of my modules around a little bit. Okay, and that about sums up our video for today, as we're about to seize Buda Budapest from the Romanians that were defending it for some reason. Uh, I intend to do some other videos related to Mios and aircraft, but I'll probably poll the community and see what they have to, have to say about what they would like to see. But I am also planning to do a collaborative slash competitive video with uh, another YouTuber, maybe this week, maybe next week. Uh, just as I've done this video right here on aircraft fighter meta, he's doing the same thing. I don't know what he's going to come up with for his meta fighter, but we're going to maybe go head to head and see whose meta fighters are actually better and have a discussion about... Uh, what we think are good ideas and good things to do with aircraft. But um, until then, we're having ourselves a good time here. The weather's not that bad where I'm at right now. Uh, I hope everything's good for y'all, and I hope that you are all having a pleasant day. I will see you later.